Are you an overwhelmed SaaS founder ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds you know and those you don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Welcome back to the SaaS Fuel Podcast, where entrepreneurship is like fishing. Both take an ideal combination of patience, timing, skill, understanding, and persistence. Well, I'll be your fishing guide today. My name is Jeff Maines. In last week's episode, we talked with Armando Biondi, another amazing serial entrepreneur and angel investor in over 250 startups. This guy has been there, done that, and someone definitely pay attention to. It's just one more reason I love doing this is the high quality people I get to hang with. But the cool thing is that you get to also. So if you haven't let your mind surf the last episode, then you've got to go check that out. Well, there is never a dull moment around here. And our next guest is no exception. Today, we're talking with April Lamont, an experienced bootstrap founder. April has pioneered the creation and growth of groundbreaking prop tech programs and services for residential and mixed-use communities nationwide. April's innate curiosity with consumer behavior grew with her experience as a C-level marketing executive for global companies like PepsiCo, Kraft Foods, and Armstrong World Industries. A four-time founder, her current venture is Alessant, a residential experience platform which connects real-life communities through a customizable app. I mean, this thing is a great experience. I see a lot of these. And I saw this and was blown away. I really wish my community had this. On the personal side, April lives in beautiful Bozeman, Montana, is a fly fishing enthusiast, musician, and self-proclaimed amateur chef inspired by her Mexican heritage. I mean, fly fishing and cooking. Fish tacos? uh, Yes, please. Always giving back, April and her husband are involved in the Montana-based Warriors and Quiet Waters organization, which uses fly fishing as a tool to help combat veterans reintegrate into civilian life. Love that. Well, put your fish tacos down and put your hands together for this week's guest, April Lamont. Why do some companies achieve explosive growth while others sink into the depths? What do exceptional SaaS companies do that mediocre companies don't? And what can SaaS leaders learn from fish? Hey, check out my book, Small Fish, Big Pond, Building a World-Class Business that Swims Circles Around Competitors. This book delivers powerful business lessons guaranteed to change the way you view your business and includes hands-on exercises and growth tools to get lightning-fast results. Get your copy today at Small Fish, Big Pond. Use the code SASFUEL to unlock special bonus audio and video content. Well, hey, April, welcome to SAS Fuel. Thank you, Jeff. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Well, tell me a little bit about um, Alessant and uh, and your journey of creating that and creating community. Well, um, Alessant has a very interesting background. We uh, were approached by a large master plan residential community developer in South Orange County, California, who noticed that everyone had this device in their hand. And he said, if I want my community to be vibrant and relevant to the people that live here, I need to get on this device. Um, That was early in 2017, and he challenged us to build an app for him. We took on the challenge, and by fall of that same year, we launched the Ranch Life app for Rancho Mission Viejo. And uh, within 90 days, Jeff, over 90% of the people that lived there were logged in active users of that app. And it was kind of a big light bulb for us that this really was um, certainly a need that he recognized, but that he was probably on the forefront of a greater need in the industry. And so in 2018, we took the underlying code from his app and we branded that as Alessant. And then we started approaching other residential developers across the country to see if they, in fact, had the same need. And today, um, we just signed our 72nd client 
72nd community that's, that's using our using our platform. And uh, so basically what it does is it lets a, a developer community create a branded native mobile app for their community. So when you engage, you're not engaging with Alessant, you're clicking on your icon for your community. So it feels very relevant and very personalized to each and every person that lives within um, one of our client communities. That is amazing. Just thinking about uh, one of the things that, that just shocked me was the amount of adoption that you have. User adoption is one of the things that I think a lot of SaaS founders struggle with and, and app builders, but uh, you've really cracked that. So what has been the big secret to getting user adoption in that percentage of the community using the app? Yeah, I think that it is, you know, where we live, the communities that we buy homes in is such a personal uh, decision. And it really is a decision that, it, yes, it's uh, rationally where we live, but there's a deep emotional connection because it says something about us publicly. It uh, is, is an important part of the decision, not just for today, but where we might see our family growing. Um, people, um, certainly through the pandemic, we saw it in spades. I mean, this desire to really connect with community um, and my community really matters. Um, so we have all these virtual communities um, that are created in social channels, but where I physically live is probably the most important place in people's lives. Interesting. Well, there's a there you know, are other community apps out there. Um, how do you differentiate Alessant from those? Um, or you know, some of them are, are free, some of them, uh, you know, there are paid. Sure. So how do you really differentiate yourself in a, a marketplace that's maybe a little bit crowded? Sure. Or is it crowded? Well, um, we took two um, two primary steps at the very beginning of our journey that I think differentiates us from everything else that's out there. The first is that we brand to the community. And so there, you don't, the, the person that lives in these communities doesn't walk through an Alessant door to get to their community. Um, they, or a Facebook door. Or a Facebook door or a next door <laughs> right. door. So there's um, no friction between us as That's the nice. company that provides the app and that end user access to their community. Um, and again, because of this really personal identification with where you live, I think that wound up being a really, really smart decision. Um, the second thing that we did is we configured the, the database of all content so that it can be parsed or curated based on different types of user personas. So if I live in one neighborhood within a bigger community, my version of the app can show me everything that everyone gets to see, but then also my specific neighborhood. And um, that happens a lot in these larger communities where you might have, you know, homes that anyone could buy, but then there's also some that are restricted to certain, um, you know, over 55 plus buyers, an active adult buyer. Right, right. So that's become real common. It's very common. And so the 55 plus active adult component might have their own clubhouse, their own events, and yet they can still participate in the broader community. We don't show the things that the rest of the community can't access to them. And it's like, why show them something and then tell them, no, 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 you can't have it. So, <laughs> right, right. so it's this idea of making the community relevant to me. So these user roles let us do that within the community. But the other thing that it's done is it's allowed us to travel upstream to that home shopper. So the home shopper can have access to content that's relevant if you're deciding whether or not to buy here. Um, if you're interested in what those amenities might be, who are the builders, what models do they have, when are they open? Um, so engaging with people pre-buy, um, even under contract and waiting for my home to be built, which happens a lot today, to people that move in. So you can have a single app for your community and unlimited personas or unlimited user roles that continue to drive awareness for everything that's going on that's relevant to me and the stage I'm in in that community. So those, the branding piece and this user role configuration were um, 
Jeff, really fortuitous decisions that we made early on. And, and I think it's, they're decisions that are um, very difficult to embed in, in any existing platform that's already, you know, off and running. So they become a, a competitive insulator for us. That makes a lot of sense. And then I can think about my own home buying journey. And that would have been so helpful. I mean, even just thinking about pre-buy because you're working with developers. And so thinking about floor plans and you know what's available and being able to see all of that and having that engagement um, essentially real time instead exactly. of the old way. I have to figure out when they're open and go visit and take plans and, and that kind of thing. Exactly. And what what happens in these large communities is the homes are built by a builder. You know, we know these names like Toll or Regency or sure. you know, big big home uh, home builders. But the developers building the whole community. So it's like, um, how do you couple the whole community and the lifestyle that's part of living in that community together with the nuts and bolts decision of which house do I buy? So it's really tying the two together, the product being the home together with the lifestyle coming from the community into a much more cohesive process. I can see that being a differentiator for the builders as well. Yeah, in, yeah, exactly. You know, in choosing one community or another, because you really get a feel for what that community is about before you commit. That is such a good point. And um, there are many things now that we've layered into the platform that even strengthens that idea. For example, we can now use our apps to activate controlled access points within the community. So clearly, the obvious use case is for a resident who wants to, who makes a reservation to use a tennis court, they shake their phone, the door opens, and they go play tennis. But we can also move that technology upstream to that home shopper who wants to take a, you know, a self-guided tour. I don't necessarily want to be sold. I want to go and see and see what it feels like to move through that clubhouse or go see the pool or those courts. And so we can release those credentials for access points temporarily through the app too. So come on Saturday, bring the kids, see what it's like to hang out at the pool, meet some of the families that already here live here, ask them how they like it, you know, hear from our residents firsthand. Um, take a, you know, just if you have a chance, go take a look at this clubhouse because there's a lot of cool things that we think you and your family would enjoy. So it's, it's kind of giving uh, the keys to the kingdom to let that home shopper explore on their own, on a self-guided basis and, and not have to worry about, I got to give you a fob and then I got to remember to take the fob back. And this can all be released contact less through the app. That's really nice. Uh, I, I really wish we had this. And uh, yeah, I think we paid for uh, a few lost key cards uh, over the, the last 20 years. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that would have been really, really nice to have it built into the, the yeah, app. That's what we're hearing from our communities as well. So is your development, is it client driven? Is it uh, product based? And yeah, how have you seen the, the growth of the app or the evolution from the initial idea to where you are today? Yeah, great question. So we're very vertically focused on the residential segment of the real estate industry. And so because of that, we hear a lot of things from our clients in terms of ways that product could be uh, improved or processes that are kind of a pain in the neck for them today. And they come to us and say, gosh, if you could figure out a way to solve this in the app, that would really make our lives so much easier. And so we are constantly listening, constantly getting feedback from our clients. So all of our innovation is client-led. Uh, these are things that our clients bring to us. And then sometimes they say it and it seems obvious. And we're like, well, everyone would have, <laughs> everyone's life would be better if we could get this into the app. And so that is what drives our innovation, what we hear from our, from our client communities. That's great. So are, are you technical? Are you the, the one that builds the app or comes up with the ideas or no? What, what is your role? So my I'm um, not either. <laughs> <laughs> so my co-founder and I started our first company 10 years ago. I was 50 and he was 25. And he was uh, is the technical genius of this whole operation. And so it uh, my background is more in the marketing and um, business development side. So with his technical chops and my um, in 
background in consumer marketing and understanding com- consumer behavior, we really complement each other really well. And um, you know, some people might think that multi generational founder founder team might be challenging, but we we actually have found it to be really really rewarding. We um, have the highest regard and respect for what each other brings to the table. And I think those two different perspectives have, have not just from a technical standpoint, but generational standpoint has, has made us a stronger company as a result. Without a doubt. Yeah. I love that, that diversity. And I think that having the, the different backgrounds and different viewpoints is super valuable in a, a company. So how have you seen that play out? What advantages has that, that uh, diversity had in, in Allison and your success? Yeah. Um, when we first started on this path of expanding Alessant on this software platform, I worried that um, that people wouldn't want to buy software from a baby boomer. And what I quickly found out is the people that buy Alessant are also baby boomers. <laughs> so they look a lot like Interesting. more like me than a Gen Xer, like my business partner. And um, as a result of this collaboration and how we work together, I can talk about technology in a way that is really focused on the enablement of uh, that's, you know, what is enabled as a result of the technology versus getting into all the nuts and bolts of how, how the technology comes together. And so what I tend to hear is you really hear, you really understand our industry. I understood every word you just said. (laughs) you know, as it relates to the technology and really... That's um, helpful. And so that's really helpful. So it's worked out um, to be a great combination. Uh, Mike Swanson, the co-founder, is great in front of our clients. So it's, uh, you know, they love to hear what he's thinking about as more of the technologist and what he sees coming down the pike. Um, So that's, it's just a great yin-yang. That's really good. So as you continue to, to build, where do you see the, this, the application going and, uh, and expanding into you know, community and, and additional features, that kind of thing, and enabling people to connect? Yeah, yeah. So um, we're in the middle of a, a release of a new user interface. And with that is coming a number of, of additional tools within the platform to foster that sense of connection. Um, we have rebuilt the whole mapping platform within uh, within Alessant that is more centric on where am I now and where do I want to go. And so, you know, whether I'm riding a bike, walking, driving, public transportation, it's much easier for me to get a sense of the broader overview of the community and then where I am in relation to where I want to go. So just making... Um, Certainly, the space is more uh, making people more aware of the spaces that are available for them to use, but also just taking that friction out of, okay, well, where is it? How do I get there? So making connecting people with spaces is a really important part of, of this new release and, and our overall mission as a company. Another thing that we um, are focused on is creating a mobile identification card, an ID card within the app. So it's this idea of really fostering identity. This is my community and my community knows me. And so that sense of connection to um, to where I live, strengthening that. Um, the access control piece, do I really need to carry around that fob or that card uh, that I'm eventually going to lose and have to pay to replace? <laughs> um, why yep. can't I use, why can't I use my phone? Because my phone, you know, 99 times out of 100 is already in my hand. And if I lose my phone, I, my phone is going to tell me where to find it, right? So it's, um, it's again, this sense of making it more personal, um, more relevant to each individual resident within the community. And at the end of the day, our clients build these amazing communities because they want to activate people. They want them to be involved. They want them to take advantage of everything that's there to offer. And if people don't aren't aware of what's available to them, and it and 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 they're overwhelmed by content versus making it personal and relevant to me, then um, I mean those are just the ripe areas for Alison to 
to really make a difference. So what have been the biggest challenges you faced in, in building the app and in launching this out to the world? You know, um, the technical piece, of course, was challenging because, you know, we build on both the iOS platform, um, on the Android platform. We also produce a web-based version of every app. And so, um, you know, just getting our chops up to speed on each of those platforms, um, as they have new releases, then there's often um, we need to adjust on our side. I mean, there's a plethora of different devices. So we want to make sure that our apps are rendering beautifully on every device. Um, and as new devices come out, it does. we do take a really close look to make sure that those screen sizes and ratios are, are going to, to look beautiful. Um, so those are kind of the nuts and bolts piece. I think the bigger challenge has been around the industry just being slow to adopt new technology. And despite the fact that we all, you know, book a flight, book our hotel room, rent a car, check out restaurants, make a reservation, we all know we do all of these things on our phone. So one of the biggest challenges early on was just making the case for, hey, the people that live in your community who do all of these things, bring that same level of expectations to where they live. And so just, you know, telling that story and um, getting really f focused on some early adopter customers that uh, the rest of the industry look to as leaders and innovators, um, that was really where we, where we focused early on. And, and now it's like, I don't know exactly what you do, but if, if that community is using you, I, I know I need to take a really close look. So we're starting to get that reference kind of value from our early clients who who really were the leaders and, and took a chance on us. Nice. And I will say, um, just to kind of brag a little bit, um, our first tranche of clients in 2018, um, most all of our clients signed a three to five year contract. Our 2018 clients signed three year contracts. So they were up for renewal at the beginning of this year and 100% of them renewed. So that's fantastic. So we feel really proud that the product is delivering. It fits what they need. We're responsive to what, um, you know, improvements they've brought us. And we've just got a great uh, CX team here with us in Bozeman that supports each of our clients from day one and ongoing. So we, we never, we never toss the software over the fence. We stay a partner with each community uh, through the life of the, of the app. That's definitely a differentiator, staying involved through the process and, and you know, certainly speaks to, to the renewal rates. Is that, uh, lots of companies out there would love to have 100% retention. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't kid myself to, to think that will always be the case, but um, it's certainly a, a great goal and it drives the, the, the support and the leadership that we bring to our clients um, every day because we know, you know, if we do a good job earning, earning their trust, earning their um, sense of loyalty to our product that, you know, we're going to do the same back. So it's, it's been a really great, it's been a great um, relationship so far. So what's one thing in your business and, uh, and particularly with Alessant as you continue to grow that, uh, that has happened that you didn't expect? You know, I don't know that I expected such a high adoption rate. Um, you know, even on those 2018 clients that came in and we reached that 90% adoption rate, today they're like 97, 98% adoption. Um, you know, as more people move in, as more people within the household have their own device and want their own app, you know, I... Um, I am surprised, honestly, at um, how important part this is. I mean, I, we had this conviction that it would be, but to actually see that level of, of uh, adoption and not just a one-time download, but people are in there every week, at least once a week. And so um, it's just given us a lot of permission to think bigger. And so uh, we're constantly asking ourselves, if you have a single 
doorway that you have your residents walking through and that doorway has your community's name on it. What else um, can we provide in terms of service or um, functionality that continues to make that relationship really strong? So think about it this way. I could live in a community and you could be asking me to download 10 different apps one for events, one for the restaurant, one for court reservations, or you could say, sure. go through my door and everything that you need is here. And so that's the big, I think the big aha is, is um, just how much that idea of a branded door, that direct channel of communication is just how vital that is. And that's what's led us to access control, right? Because that's that's um, that's kind of the next step is like, okay, I want to walk through one door to engage with my community, but why do I still have this fob in my hand, this piece of plastic card? So that, that was the next right. um, step. Now we're looking at the whole IoT space around what are those smart devices at, in the home? Um, many of our communities have a rental component. So can we now take this idea of access control to shared spaces to access control for my space? Um, what other systems in the home can we start to loop in? So that's where we see this going is, okay, we've, we've got you, you know, at the community level. And now how do we, how do we bring that same level of convenience centralization, lack of friction, uh, potentially into, into the home. And that would be fantastic. Uh, have uh, smart devices and, but I have different apps. And so, Again, it's, you know, <laughs> how many different apps, <laughs> multiple I, doors. I know I have a folder on my phone that has all of my IOT apps and, you know, it's full. And if I could just have one and I could, you know, leverage all of the technology of those dozen different platforms, but just walk through one door, one app to get to them. I think that would be a huge win for people. That's great. We're going to take a quick sponsor break. And when we come back, we're going to have a conversation with April about the biggest challenge faced in building the business and the most important lesson she has learned right after this. Ever feel like you're in uncharted waters? Wish there was a checklist or clear path to follow for your stage of growth? We are the one. Champion Leadership Group helps SaaS founders scale from $1 million to $10 million to $20 million and beyond. Only one in 40,000 companies grows to $10 million in revenue. The rest stay small or die along the trail. Building a business is treacherous if you go alone. Instead, travel with experienced SaaS founders and expert guides who help chart your course to consistent results and provide support every step of the way. Create your free growth map today at championleadership.com. Well, welcome back to SaaS Fuel. My guest today, April Lamont from Alessant. And so April, what is the biggest challenge you faced in building your app SaaS uh, up to this point and how are you tackling it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, our biggest challenge is going about getting uh, market adoption. Right. So um, how quickly can we grow? So we've employed a couple of different strategies to help accelerate our growth. Um, the first is that um, there are a couple of different industry advisors slash consulting firms that produce lists of the 50 fastest growing communities in the country. And they're very similar, but there's some differences and nuances in those lists. But it gives us our bullseye target for the, the communities and the developers behind them that are on everyone's radar. And so we've systematically harvested that list over the last 10 years to build our bullseye target. And really, that's really smart. Yeah. I mean, it, it I mean, thank goodness, because it has worked out really well, you know, because they're the thought leaders, the opinion leaders, there's, they are um, the communities and the developers that the industry looks to for inspiration ideas. And, um, and so to have the marquee clients and the communities, um, part of our, our, um, our client base has been really, really powerful. And so, um, 
it's there's a you know we're starting to get to the point where there's a little bit of FOMO, right? It's like, well, they have it, they have it, they have it. Right. How come I, I really need to get on the ball? I don't want to be seen as um, maybe I missed the boat to be the early adopter, but I don't want to be. I, I'd rather be you don't want to be left follower. behind. Yeah, I'd rather be a fat follower yeah. than than seen as a laggard. And so um, that focus on those really high profile communities and developers have have really helped us to ignite our growth. So that's that's one. The second is that we've also focused on developers that have multiple projects. So a great example of this is Johnson Development uh, Corporation in Texas, where we started with one and then two and continued to prove ourselves. And now we have 11 of their, com- their active communities. And so this idea of landing and expanding with those influential developers, Toll Brothers is another great example where, you know, we earn our stripes and then, you know, we, we essentially have permission, right. To then expand within their portfolio. Right. So that's, that's the other piece. I mean, for as large, I think it's, I don't know, $34 trillion segment of the real estate market, uh, as huge as residential real estate is, it's, it's pretty concentrated in terms of who the players are. And I think probably the, I guess the third thing, so high profile, land and expand with multi-location developers. The third thing is really the core value that drives our company. And that is that we deliver on our promises. We do not make promises lightly. We make them with great intention. And when we say we're going to do something, we deliver. And um, that hasn't been the industry's experience, generally speaking, with technology. Um, you know, there have been some missed expectations and disappointments. And we just knew that, gosh, if we're going to do this. We have to be the trusted partner. But if we say we're going to do it, we're, we, we're going to deliver. And so that is really the, the core, core value behind our business internally, externally. You know, as we grow, our team makes promises every day to each other. And those promises are in service of public promises. And so we're, we are just incredibly mindful and uh, incredibly serious about the promises we make. That's really important. I mean, especially working with, uh, with builders on multiple projects. You know, they want to work with a company that, uh, that they can depend on. Exactly. Exactly. So what is one lesson that you've learned as a founder that you think everybody should learn at some point in their life? I think that it's really, really important to start a business with a client. Um, we are a bootstrapped company. We're self-funded. We are, Love that. Um, yeah, we're um, cash flow positive and profitable. And, you know, over the last few years, that has seemed a little old fashioned. Um, as, yes. You know, and um, I think what we're seeing in the markets now is uh, a little bit of a reckoning around um, spending other people's money and maybe not ever getting to the place where of profitability. And so um, for us, it was always really important to have that client champion who um, could not only inspire us in terms of what the product needed to accomplish to, you know, we didn't want to make a, you know, a solution here that created 10 problems from somebody over there. So having a full, really in-depth, full understanding of that um, environment in which your product is going to live, but then also someone who's, you know, frankly committed to opening their wallet and paying you for the solution that you're creating. So, you know, my advice and it certainly, you know, there's plenty of opportunities for growth funding. But my advice is to really validate that there's a need, um, that your solution has a market fit, um, that those are just such critical, critical components of sustainable growth. And so um, while we may at some point think that growth funding makes sense for Alessant, it won't be because there's a ticking bomb that if we don't take money, we won't be able to meet payroll or keep the lights on. Um, we, we believe in, a, in sustainable growth versus growth at all costs. 
Well, that's really smart. And, and that is definitely something that is uh, somewhat of a lost art, particularly in the technology world, is actually building a company that uh, makes money. You know, it's all about revenue and market share, not, uh, not building a sustainable business. Right, right. And so um, for us to, to, you know, spend as we go, invest as we go in our product, um, you know, we're not lining our pockets and building our third or fourth or even second uh, vacation home. I mean, everything that we, all the revenue that we generate at this point gets plowed back into the company and into, into the product specifically. But we feel very confident that um, to be able to self-sustain our company is is in great service to our clients at the end of the day. I mean, they're building these magnificent um, communities that, that will literally take decades and decades to complete. And they don't want to turn to someone like an Alessant to have us go away, you know, midway through that journey. And so for us to be just as sustainable in our business as they are in theirs is a really important match. That makes a lot of sense. Was that something that was a challenge in the beginning in, in you know, convincing them to go with a, a new company and just wondering, you know, are you going to be around? Uh, so many tech companies up. aren't. It still comes up today. Um, it still comes up today because the, I think the communities and the developers recognize that they want a long-term commitment. This is not something, you know, if, if, if 98% of the people that live in my community have an Alison app, branded to my community. I do not want to wrestle that away from 98% of the people that live here right. because Alison goes would be away. Bad. Right. Exactly. So, I mean, it's kind of the other side of we're really sticky. We get great adoption. So you better be here tomorrow. And so um, it is a vital concern. And I think that um, back to this multi-generational um, leadership team here, the fact that I've worked for Pepsi and Kraft and multinational corporations at the C-suite level, um, it does impress upon them that, um, you know, there's someone here that really understands what, what it takes to have a sustainable company um, in terms of a, a longitudinal, um, longitudinal uh, sustainability. I'm not talking about ESG here. I'm talking about being here tomorrow, being here in a year, being here in 10 years. Right. So I think that's helped too. Well, community is a big part of, of what you're building with your app. So how does that work inside your organization and building a community with your team and your employees? Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's such a great question. I mean, we live in a place in Bozeman, Montana, that attracts Beautiful. people. Yeah, that, that, that certainly want to have a vibrant career, but have a very full life outside of work. And so that's an important part of what we look for in our team. I mean, we're building a tool, a piece of technology that fosters engagement with lifestyle. So if you go to the company team page on our website, you're gonna you're not gonna see you know the headshot in a suit. You're gonna see people outside doing things that are important to them, whether it's fishing, skiing, hiking. Um, so we we believe we're in exactly the right location here in Bozeman, Montana. That um, you know, we're, we're, we're community is important to to everyone who lives here. So it's a really nice mix between why people want to live here and the work that we're doing. And so um, it's just been a great fit. That's great. So is that one of the ways that you foster a positive work environment? Is having that that balance and engage having people engage in things that they like to do outside of work. It is. It is. Um, you know, because we're not a growth at all cost culture. I mean, we we respect that people have lives outside of the office. And so you're not going to find people here around the clock. You're not going to find people here too much after to a, after five and, and the rank and file. And, you know, maybe the founders stay a little later because it's a quiet time to get things done. But, um, you know, we give people the flexibility to kind of shift their day if they need to. We have um, a person on our team that's largely working with clients on the East Coast. So he comes in at seven and he leaves at four. I mean, so we, we, do, we, we try to allow that flexibility in the day. The other thing is, this is a little counterculture maybe right now too, is you know, we have our team co-located here. We're not a hybrid or a remote organization. 
because there's so much cross learning between clients and between team members, we have just found it really valuable to have everyone here in the office because there's a lot of that idea sharing, hey, how's your community handling this situation? Well, over here, we're doing this and over there, we're doing something else. Let's come up with the best practice across the portfolio and really help communities continue to to grow and evolve. So we've also found that having the team, uh, having an office and people come to the office, that's really helped um, our culture and uh, helped us grow. That's good. What do you think that the world will look like in, in 10 years when it comes to employees and culture and, uh, and work environments? Wow. I don't know how shiny your crystal ball is, Jeff, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, we hire, um, a lot of early professionals early in their career. We're in a college town. Montana State University has a great school of business and entrepreneurship. We bring in a lot of interns while they're in school and hire them when they graduate. You know, I think that there's going to remain a place for particularly young professionals who want to be in a collaborative environment, who want to have that informal mentorship and contact with people that have more experience than they do. That's going to be Alessant's place, I believe. Um, Like, um, you know, everywhere else, because we're so, um, so such a destination right now, affordability is a real challenge. Um, for young professionals. Sure. So we're, you know, we don't have the answer, but we're very aware that that can be a, that can be a, a challenge. But um, we think that for us anyway, having this collaboration is um, at least for those early career people are going to be really important. And, you know, as contributors um, here, you know, sort of earn their stripes and may, may have an opportunity to buy a home somewhere you know, outside of Bozeman, um, you know, we want to be flexible for that too. So I think flexibility is probably going to be the key word going forward. And um, we'll see as we grow, you know, can we remain as flexible as we are today? Or might we need to really focus on certain areas where we can provide that flexibility and others where we can't? I mean, we're still kind of a small and mighty group. We're nine full-time people here in Montana and Bozeman. So it gives us the opportunity to still be very nimble. Yeah, that's a really important skill. Something to, to keep as you continue to grow. Yeah. So you've got a, a, a lot of uh, you know, young people coming in you know, out of college. And uh, you know a lot of founders listening to this as well. I mean, some people even thinking about starting uh, you know, a new SaaS company or app company. So what is one piece of advice that you give to somebody starting out, whether that's coming into your organization or starting a a, a technology company? Yeah. um, One of the things that I think has really helped me throughout my career is getting deeply involved in the industry associations for your customer. So for me, I'm very involved in the Urban Land Institute, which is a global organization for all facets of the real estate industry. And, and it tends to be, you know, pretty high level C-suite level people that are, that are members. It's really important to be curious. It's really important to invest the time to understand what's important to your client, even if it goes beyond the scope of your product, right? What are the things that they're worried about? What are the topics that are interesting to them? Um, where do they see the industry going? Where do they see opportunities or potential barriers? Um, I've always taken the approach that I want to know as much about my customers and how they view their business as my own. So um, as opposed to maybe being involved in um, like early, early in my career in a marketing organization, because I was a marketer, I was involved in the organizations, my customers were involved in. And that has been, I think I, I, that's what I would say to someone early on is who do you expect your customer to be? Who's opening your wallet and handing you money? And how do you become in, as embedded as possible in understanding that industry and those and the concerns of those people? That's where you're going to find those nuggets of opportunity to 
to solve problems that maybe um, aren't obvious um, from the outside. That is gold right there. <laughs> That's what we want to do is to solve those problems that are not obvious. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very good. Well, April, I have really enjoyed our conversation today. And thank you for being on SAS Fuel. Thank you, Jeff. I really enjoyed my time with you. And I, um, I'm so happy to have met you and be part of this uh, pro whole project. And one final question sure. is, uh, where can we find out more about you and Alessant online? Sure. Well, of course, we have a, a website, Um, But you can also uh, go to LinkedIn. And uh, we have a very active page um, for Alessant and um, myself, April Lamont. So you're, you're welcome to, to follow me there too. Fantastic. And we'll make sure and link all of those in the show notes. Terrific. All right. Thanks again, April. All right, Jeff. Have a great day. Thanks again to April Lamont for coming on the show and sharing your insights, wisdom, and resources. The creativity and thought process that goes into a venture like this is just exceptional. I love that creativity. And like I said at the top, I was blown away by April and Alessant when I saw it. I already hit up our HOA to get on board the Alessant train. So if you're like me and you want to learn more about April and Alessant, check them out at Alessant.com. That's Alessant with one L, Alessant.com. And of course, check them out on social media as well. As always, all links, highlights, resources, and full show notes are available at sasfuel.com. As a reminder, if you are enjoying the show, and I hope you are, leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sasfuel. I would love to read these on a future episode or give us a call, leave us a message at 903 SAS Fuel. Let me know that you're out there, leave some comments and feedback, and I'd love to play that on a future episode as well. Come back next week for our conversation with Dan Prince. Dan is a futurist that believes with technology we can significantly increase our average lifespan. That sounds pretty awesome. He founded his first tech company in 1993 and hasn't slowed down a bit since. He's founder and CEO of Illumisoft, who brings relationship-oriented solutions that make healthcare and healthcare research better. I can't wait to see what Dan brings, and I'll bet you can't either. So be sure and check that out next week. Until we meet again. Thanks for listening to SAS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned, are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sasfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.